a time of war. Trouble with Scotland is that it's full of Scots. A time of passion. You tell your king that William Wallace will not be ruled, and nor will any Scot while I live. <laughs> The story of one man's fight for his country's freedom. Mel Gibson is Braveheart, Thursday, 9.30 on BBC One. Two movies still to come tonight on BBC One. In 15 minutes, Houston, we definitely have a problem. Airplane 2, the sequel, is followed by more comedy. Chevy Chase stars in Fletch Lives at 5 to midnight. There's a new ward at Holby City. What do you in theatre, Mr Jordan? She's a serial swallower. Mr. May would just like to take Breathe. Well, I'm sure her father will be delighted to get that back. You smoke again, Mr. Pearson, and I will undo what I've already done. Transfer for surgery. Well, I could have made a neater incision with a lawnmower. Try not to kill any of the patients. Holby City. Anton Mayer, consultant. 12th of January on BBC One. Mom, parky. <laughs> The programme you voted best talk show is back. It's how a chat show should be done. He talks and listens and listens and then listens and listens and listens and then talks. I can remember being eight or nine years old and my mum would allow me to stay up only to watch the Parkinson show. <laughs> he beats everyone else hands down, I think. He's in a class of his own. So join me and my guests for a brand new series of Parkinson. Starting next Friday at 9.30 on BBC One. Don't miss it. An instrumental version of Brimful of Asher using lemons is just one of the highlights of a brand new series from Reeves and Mortimer starting in a couple of minutes on BBC Two. This is BBC One. Now the main evening news with Peter Sissons. The time is quarter past ten. <laughs> It's been the day of the Euro, the New Year's Day that began a new era for the European Union. Celebrations at the new European Central Bank as 11 countries finally pin their destiny to a single currency. And survivors of the Yemen hostage killing arrive back in Britain to a growing row over the way the kidnap was handled. Good evening. The Euro, once a dream for the architects of European Union, today became reality. Not yet as notes and coins in people's pockets, but as the official single currency that now binds 11 European states together. Amid the celebrations, all involved made it plain it's more than a merging of their currencies, but a landmark on the road to an even closer political union. A new year and a new era for Europe. Frankfurt celebrated the launch of the single currency in style. Outside the European Central Bank, which runs the project, crowds counted down the seconds to the Euro's arrival. Frankfurt bankers drank to the success of a currency which will be used by 290 million people in 11 countries. The Euro is a giant leap forward for European integration. It's a very important new step in the European constructions after 40 years of efforts. And it's the first time for the fall of the Empire, Roman Empire that Europe will have its own currency. At one of the few Frankfurt supermarkets open today, I went shopping with the new single currency. The till receipt gave me the choice of paying either in euros or German marks. 21,37 euros. For the moment, it's possible to pay in euros only by cheque or credit card. There'll be no notes and coins for another three years. Until then, existing national currencies, such as the mark, will continue to be used for all cash transactions. Shoppers will undoubtedly take time to get used to the single currency. Opinion polls show that a third of all EU citizens still have reservations about the project. They won't be won over until the new euro proves itself to be as strong as the old currencies it's replacing. Now the Mission Impossible has been achieved, though, the Euro is being vigorously promoted. Thousands gathered for a street party outside the European Central Bank this afternoon. Skeptical Germans are being wooed. All the information that has happened during the last months uh, has educated the public, and now there is, a, there is a different feeling towards it, and it's a feeling towards Europe and European integration. 
The crowd formed a giant euro sign, but even as people are coming to terms with the single currency, their governments are forging ahead with fresh plans. Germany wants to use its presidency of the EU during the next six months to call for more political integration in Europe, matching the economic union. In his New Year television address, Germany's Chancellor Gerhard Schröder didn't hide his intentions. Mr. Schröder indicated that governments would have to take many more decisions at the European level in future. As the euro symbol is beamed across Frankfurt tonight, the single currency has given fresh momentum to the integrationist cause. A new push is only just beginning. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Frankfurt. Here, the Shadow Trade Secretary John Redwood said claims that the euro marked the beginning of political integration confirmed the Tories' worst fears. But although Britain hasn't joined, it will be heavily involved in making the system work. One euro is worth about 70 pence, and thousands of workers in the City of London have given up their New Year break to convert stocks, bonds and bank accounts, and to make sure the markets are ready to start trading after the bank holiday. On the morning of a million hangovers, clear thinking is needed as the city prepares to start buying and selling euros. See so if there's a one million dollars against euro. I don't think he's done it. No, he's just done it. Go, go, into, go into it. <laughs> this bank trades 30,000 million pounds worth of currency each day. From Monday, a big slice of that business will be in euros. Three years of planning will ensure that everyone knows what they're doing and that the computers can cope but glitches are inevitable. Individuals may make errors, clients may make errors, sums will be transferred to the wrong accounts, people might recognize, not recognize prices in euros because they're used to looking at them in other currencies and there'll be problems of that nature, but I don't envisage major system problems. Canteen and restaurant staff have also had to give up their holidays. City hotels are booked full. So, how's it going? It's going pretty well, actually, yeah. We were here at 7 this morning and it's going OK, yeah. This is an important weekend. People have been working a long time for, for this particular weekend and, yeah, it's, it's in all of our interests to get this right. No one will know for sure until Monday whether the euro preparations have worked. Britain may have rejected the euro, but the city very definitely has not. The success of this conversion weekend is seen as important in securing London's future as the financial capital of Europe. Peter Morgan, BBC News, in the city. Eight British tourists who were kidnapped in the Yemen and survived a gun battle have arrived back in Britain. After being reunited with relatives, they paid tribute to their fellow hostages who died in the clash between the kidnappers and Yemeni government troops. The shooting left three Britons and an Australian dead. Another Briton who was wounded will remain in the Yemen until she's fit enough to travel. Very, very, very warm welcome to you. Despite a day spent travelling, the hostages were tonight able to smile as they arrived back at Gatwick Airport. Still tired, they spoke of their ordeal and of their sorrow at losing four of their friends in the bloody end to this kidnapping. I'm desperately, desperately sorry, uh, particularly as we've spent um, the last 48 hours with the gentleman who's, who's been bereaved and, it, and it's been awful. I, I, I can't say any more than that. Mrs Mattox was talking about Lawrence Whitehouse, who spoke before he left Yemen of the death of his wife Margaret, killed during the failed rescue attempt. I have had 27 years with a very wonderful person, widely respected, well-loved and well-known. I've escaped death by thousands of an inch. The Foreign Office Minister, Joyce Quinn, tonight left London to meet the hostages after summoning the Yemeni ambassador for the second time in two days. The government is still not happy with the Yemeni version of events. At Gatwick, the hostages said they were not clear who fired first, but spoke of the strength that brought them through their ordeal. It's just ordinary adventure travellers, but I, I think perhaps it would be fair to say that we are a special breed and in that, we've got qualities that bore us through all this. The former hostages will now travel home with their friends and relatives. But the Foreign Office says that over the next few days, it will want to question them individually to try to find out exactly how this tragedy happened. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News at Gatwick Airport. 
A full-scale investigation into the circumstances of the kidnapping is underway in the Yemen. The British government has expressed concern about conflicting accounts of how the hostages died following a second meeting with the Yemeni ambassador in London. A team of Scotland Yard detectives and FBI investigators have arrived in Yemen to try to establish what went wrong during the rescue attempt. The survivors of this week's bloody kidnapping may be home at last, but here in the Yemeni capital Sana'a, Western tourists are still a common sight. They've come here for the culture and seem unperturbed by the brutal drama that took place in the south of the country only three days ago. Most say they've found nothing but kindness in the Yemenis they've met, but still they are an easy target for any extremists with a grudge against the West. <laughs> Yemen's interior minister announced on Thursday that his forces had foiled a plot to blow up the British consulate in Aden. In a poor country awash with guns, his government appears keen to broadcast the international nature of Yemen's Islamic extremists. In a combined effort with Britain and the US, the interior ministry here has launched an investigation into last Monday's kidnapping, which left four tourists dead and two wounded. The British government says it's still not getting enough information about what happened. The four detectives from Scotland Yard, now in Sana'a, will doubtless be trying to learn more about whether the shootout with the kidnappers was really necessary. What happened on Tuesday is something very different from the normal uh, uh, kidnapping incidents, and we need to work out exactly what the implications are. But Yemeni society can be bewildering and often unfathomable, even to other Arabs. The men from London and Washington now have an uphill task before them. The fact that both Britain and America have sent investigation teams here to Yemen shows just how seriously they're taking this recent kidnapping. They want to know more about who the kidnappers were and whether or not they're part of a wider plot to attack Westerners in the Middle East. Frank Gardner, BBC News, Sana'a. Transport police in North Wales are investigating the death of a teenager who was hit by a train at Gair Wen on Anglesey. The 18-year-old was walking with a friend by the side of the track. He was taken to hospital in Bangor, but died later. Police say the discovery of a car owned by a couple who've been missing since September with their two foster daughters is a major breakthrough in their investigation. Geoffrey and Jennifer Bramley disappeared from their home in Cambridgeshire after being told they couldn't adopt the children. A climber has died after falling more than a thousand feet on Ben Nevis in the Scottish Highlands. Paul Fuchs from Nottingham was climbing with three other people. Four people died in the same area on Tuesday when they were hit by an avalanche. Their three companions who survived left hospital today. Former ministers who served in the Labour government in the late 60s have admitted that some of the Cabinet's decisions may have been seriously mistaken. Lord Callaghan, who was Home Secretary at the time, said it was wrong not to have included the police in the Race Relations Act. His admission coincided with the publication of the Cabinet records of 30 years ago. Secret government documents show the depth of the 1968 economic crisis after the devaluation of the pound and worsening race relations. Asians fleeing from Kenya added to the tension which followed Enoch Powell's notorious Rivers of Blood speech. The government brought in the Race Relations Act and originally it was intended that the police would have had to comply. It would have been an offence for an officer to have discriminated racially. But after complaints from the Police Federation, the Cabinet backed down, a move which the then Home Secretary now regrets. That was a mistake. We should have insisted on the police being in there at that time. Uh, but there was very strong representations and we gave way on it. I regret that we did. We should have insisted on it. With the report on Stephen Lovins's death due within weeks, Lord Callaghan's regret highlights concerns of black people 30 years later about the way they're treated by the police. Another revelation is that the 1982 Falklands War might have been avoided. There was a 1968 plan to hand over the island's sovereignty to Argentina and then lease them back, but it was abandoned. Nicholas Jones, BBC News. The government's been defending its treatment of immigrants and asylum seekers after the Archbishop of Canterbury used his New Year message to call for more openness and generosity towards refugees. The Archbishop said newspaper headlines were to blame for whipping up fear and hostility towards foreigners, something which he said 
went against Christian teaching. The Archbishop's New Year message is thought to have been inspired by a visit to a refugee centre earlier this week. He met two Slovakian Romani children seeking asylum. The police said, if you take, say, say a word, I'll kill your daughter. The, 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 the Dr. Carey appeals for tolerance and understanding for all the millions of refugees throughout the world, many of whom, he says, have made a significant impact upon history. Probably history's most well-known refugee was a baby called Jesus. Shortly after his birth, the Bible tells us his family had to flee to Egypt, a refugee from political powers that were determined to destroy him. And the Christian faith has a special place for the stranger, the ones we may not yet understand, those different from ourselves. The Archbishop's thoughts on immigration will be weighed carefully by the Home Office, criticised by refugee organisations who say it applies the rules too strictly. More than 45,000 refugees are currently seeking asylum in the United Kingdom. Local authorities are obliged to look after people arriving in their area. The Home Office must then decide who is genuinely seeking asylum from persecution or danger and who has come to benefit from better economic circumstances. They can uh, wait in the asylum queue for long periods without having their case resolved. We need to resolve those cases quickly and we need to remove those who are undermining our asylum system, the worst enemy of the genuine refugee, who are those who are making false claims for asylum. Further legislation is imminent. The debate rekindled by the Archbishop today will inevitably be an emotive one. Chris West, BBC News. Millions of people across the world took to the streets last night to celebrate the arrival of the new year. In Britain, most of the festivities passed off peacefully, with Edinburgh staging the largest event. But abroad, not all the celebrations went as smoothly. In Edinburgh, a golden greeting to 1999. The authorities had hoped that 200,000 revellers would turn up to be dazzled. They weren't disappointed. A few hours later in New York, celebrations that would have been visible, according to the organisers, on the planet Mars. But elsewhere, fireworks used for a very different purpose. French riot police were out on the streets in Strasbourg. 23 people were arrested. And in the Philippines, firecrackers ruined the new year for more than 400. Several had to have parts of their fingers amputated. This one, oh, deadly! <laughs> Celebrations in Tokyo appeared more restrained. The gong dispels evil spirits, which many Japanese believe have dogged the country's economy over the past year. Berlin was in historic mood. Later this year, she once again becomes the capital of a united Germany. But wherever the new year was marked, the party organisers can't relax for long. They're now working out how to make it a thousand times better next time around. And the countdown has already begun. John Young, BBC News. And that's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. <laughs>Good evening. The first hunts of the year were today greeted with protests and a campaigner's promise to make them the last. Anti-hunters say they're confident that abolition of hunting is just months away, but the hunt says the sport is as popular as ever. Ruth Clark reports. A traditional sight on New Year's Day morning in Ottery St Mary for decades, but this year they were joined by protesters. We collected 400 pounds from people who came and supported us. For a psychiatric report, I decided. No, for child abuse report, child abuse report. We stand here today representing the vast majority of the population who think that this kind of thing that goes on, this disgusting ceremony that takes place day in and day out, two or three times a week, is quite obscene and has no place in a modern, caring, humane society. I feel sorry for them because they don't understand what the countryside is all about and that hunting is not a bloodthirsty occupation. Most people who ride just come out to, to ride and enjoy the countryside and that side of it. The League says it's confident their campaign this year will result in a ban on hunting and not be influenced by a very few. So a happy new year and good hunting in 1999. But the hunt says its following is as strong as ever and we'll see many more New Year's in like this. 
Police arrested 115 people in Devon and Cornwall during the New Year's Eve celebrations. Police say the number of arrests is similar to previous years. Most were made for alleged assaults. There were also a large number of drunken disorderly offences. Police say there were no major incidents at either Dartmouth or Torquay, both scenes of big celebrations. Plymouth was one of Britain's cities that could have been devastated if Russia had launched a nuclear attack. A secret document from 1967, which was made public today, shows military leaders believe the Soviets had planned to attack the city and its naval base with a two-megaton bomb. The Southwest's first education action zone is officially operational from today. Radical ideas to improve exam results and attendance levels will be promoted during the coming year for schools around Devonport in Plymouth. On to the weather now for tomorrow. It's a mixture of sunshine and showers. Temperatures around 10 degrees Celsius, that's 50 Fahrenheit, but it'll feel cold in a strong to gale force south.